Altogether, we were on the Siegfried line for about three weeks, and uh, my memories of that uh, are pretty much blurred. It was mostly mud and cabbages, and every now and then uh, we did have a, a slight move forward, but for the most part we were uh, just in the foxholes, usually filled with water. American soldiers, on the whole, I believe, find it very difficult to hate. We spoke of the Germans, and thought of the Germans as our enemy, but there was no such thing as violent hatred. The non-commissioned officer in the American army is unique. He has to be the leader of his men, but many of the men under him can also be leaders. One of the chief problems that faces any replacement officer is measuring up to the opinions the men had of the officers that uh, commanded them before. And after we got all the battalions settled down in their foxholes for the night, I dug out a pair of blue silk pajamas that my wife had insisted that I put in my bedroll and put them on and crawled in my bedroll to sleep for the night. Of course, this news spread around over the battalion immediately, and my purpose was achieved because all of the men felt that if the old man had gotten in his silk pajamas and gone to bed, that certainly there was no trouble or... They weren't in great danger, so they relaxed and were able to get a good night's rest. These are the men who served in the 84th Infantry Division, the division that distinguished itself in a series of critical engagements during World War II. Thus, this story could be the story of any infantry division where the uncommon virtues of courage, endurance, and self-sacrifice became the commonplace. beginning of November 1944, the defeat of Germany appeared imminent. To the east, Russian armies had pushed their way through Poland and the Balkans. To the south, Anglo-American forces were moving relentlessly up the Italian peninsula. To the west, Allied armies, having advanced through France and the Low Countries, now gathered along the borders of Western Germany. Good old M1 rifle. Semi-automatic, breech-loaded, Seems a lot heavier than it did 20 years ago. My name is John Shaw. I was with the 84th Infantry Division as a buck private during World War II. I was one of these uh, ASTP boys. 3,000 of us shipped down to the 84th Division in April before we went overseas in 1944. And we were trained hard and sent overseas in September and were in England for a while and then we caught the Red Ball Express and then before we knew it, we were right on the edge of the line, ready to go into combat. And we were all of us uh, uh, kind of wondering what things were going to be like. We could see the, uh, the shells going off, we could hear them. And we were all sort of nervous, but I don't think anyone was really fully conscious and aware of what was going to happen. The men of the 84th Division had managed to penetrate the enemy lines a few hundred yards east of the Dutch frontier. But the Siegfried line barred the way to further advance. This fortified zone of tank traps, gun emplacements, and pillboxes had become a shield behind which weary German troops now assembled. General Siegfried Westphal, Chief of Staff to Field Marshal von Rundstedt, had this to say of the situation. It was essential for the German high command in the West 
to gain time in order to re-equip the West fortifications called Siegfried Line for defense purposes. We had to make every effort, therefore, to see to it that our troops could maintain this position as long as possible. Westlich dieser Siegfriedlinie also noch in Belgien und Luxemburg behaupten konnten. The West fortifications had no weapons. The wire entanglements had been dismantled, and even some of the keys to unlock the rusty dugouts were missing. The defensive value of these constructions was so minimal that the soldiers preferred to live in a trench under the open sky rather than have the concrete ceiling collapse over their heads. We reported this to Hitler, who flew into a rage and retorted, the whole world trembles in fear of this phenomenal achievement of German technology. The 84th Division's immediate mission, part of a general offensive, was to crack the Siegfried Line at the town of Geilenkirchen and then establish beachheads on the nearby Rohr River. Beyond lay the main objective, the Rhine. I'm Lieutenant General Lewis W. Truman. During World War II, I was a Colonel, Chief of Staff of the 84th Infantry Division, and Chief of Staff to Alexander R. Bowling, the Commanding General of the 84th Division. The intelligence which we received was of the very best. The individuals clear down to the squad level uh, were indoctrinated, instructed exactly what their jobs were to be. There is no question but that we were very, had very much confidence that we would be able to carry out this mission. I know also that the regiments, the battalions, the companies, and the platoons and squads had that same feeling of confidence. The 84th Division would be supported by the British on the left and the American 2nd Armored and 102nd Infantry on the right. Facing them were several Folks Grenadier Divisions and a number of crack panzer units. At precisely five minutes to seven on the morning of November 18th, an artillery barrage signaled that the attack had commenced. Kirken uh, was about three miles away from where we were, and uh, so happened that our uh, regiment was leading the attack, and I uh, happened to be in the first platoon of the first company, and I happened to be in the first squad of the first platoon, and so happened that I was the first scout. So uh, I was first. And uh, we came through a little woods and out onto a sport plot, so we shot across this uh, clearing and into the outskirts of the town. And there was a trench there, and we walked up the trench, uh, all of us feeling pretty uh, happy at this point and, and uh, pretty proud of ourselves for having gotten that far. And we seemed to me the whole company was strung out into one big line. And uh, all of a sudden, a German in a window three blocks away opened up on our, our column in this trench with a machine gun. And of course, we all hit the dirt. And we just waited there for uh, somebody to do something. Finally, a, a British tank uh, lumbered up the street uh, off to our side and, and fired two shells right into that window. And so that was the end of that. I'm Richard K. Hawkins. I was a first lieutenant with a Company 334th Infantry of the 84th Infantry Division. It was necessary for complete cooperation between various branches of the Army. And since it was necessary for the infantrymen to attack on foot, seize the ground and hold it, it was also necessary for artillery to 
neutralize these positions before the infantrymen jumped off. It was a wonderful show of cooperation between these different branches. We got through Geilenkirchen and we started on the road that we thought was taking us right to Berlin. We felt great and we were pretty excited about being in the war. And after we'd gone about 500 yards up the road, the 88 started coming in. Like fools, we ran into a little woods and all of us tried our best to uh, uh, dig into the ground. We used our hands and just tried to claw the dirt, trying to dig in. In the meantime, these shells were coming into the trees and bursting all around us and uh, our friends were being hit and were screaming for medics. This lasted at a uh, scene for about half an hour. I suppose it lasted about five minutes. I am Fritz Kramer. I was with the 84th Division as a rather elderly soldier from my 35th to my 37th year. I do remember very clearly now the feelings we had, like all men who go into battle for the very first time. We were uncertain. We were very unsure of ourselves. We knew very well that combat was very different from training. And I remember this excitement. And I may frankly say, for all soldiers who may come after us, we were also full of fear. Not necessarily fear of the enemy, but fear of our own making it or not making it. How would we stand up? I think our general told us later that he had been praying in those hours when he committed the men he had trained for the first time for combat. I know now, and we all know now, that the battle went well and that our one regiment that was attached to combat proven British forces did well, found the praise of the British and we immediately gained an extraordinary increase in self-confidence. We had met the enemy and while we certainly hadn't performed any great heroics, we felt our self-confidence greatly increased. I'm Donald Phelps. I was a sergeant in the 333rd Infantry of the 84th Division. We found that we could sneak up to pillboxes easily at night, uh, hit and run. The biggest problem in this type of action was that the regular emplacements of the German army in the pillboxes had everything so zeroed in that uh, all major road intersections were under constant interdicting fire. By the 21st of November, the Siegfried Line had been dented. The objectives in and around Geilenkirchen had been taken. The 84th now headed for the Rohr River, a few miles distant. General Bowling picked the village of Lenick as the ideal location for the planned river crossing. Before our actual combat experience, we always thought that engineers were people who came along after we passed through and repaired bridges and so forth. We actually had engineer squads with each rifle platoon whose function was to place explosive charges in pillbox and braziers. And uh, this helped a great deal in overcoming this resistance. In the murderous frontal attack that followed, several discoveries were made. All sectors of the German Western Front had strict orders to relinquish as little German territory as possible. Every inch of ground was to be defended tenaciously.
the uncertainty concerning the Allied situation posed an especially conspicuous problem. One never knows what the enemy has up his sleeve. One does not know for certain how strong he is. One does not know about his disposition. Many things can only be guessed. But there are certain impressions one does acquire. We were of the opinion that the American unit, excellently equipped and under good leadership, was headed for ultimate success, confident of victory. Besides, the command was prudent, advancing step by step, and justly trying to avoid bloodshed wherever possible. Geführt, siegesicher, dem Erfolg entgegensteuerte. By the end of November, the German defenses west of the Ruhr had been either captured or neutralized by men of the 84th Division. On December 2nd, the coveted prize of Lenick fell to the neighboring 102nd Division. To sum up the actions of the 84th Division, in the Geil and Kirchen area, in the Siegfried Line. It had reduced or captured eight strong points or villages. It had captured or destroyed over 112 bunkers. It had captured 28 officers and over 1,500 enlisted men. It had engaged 15 different kinds of German units to include SS troops and Panzer units. And we might say, as an overall sum up, every mission had been accomplished. While the Allies made preparations for the crossing of the Ruhr, a major offensive was about to be launched by the combined German forces. The offensive, codenamed Watch on the Rhine, would be more generally known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was Hitler's last opportunity to achieve the initiative on the Western Front, and at least 28 divisions would be engaged in this desperate gamble. The field that I am on this afternoon is representative of those around Marsh, Belgium that are now being farmed again. In December of 1944, much in contrast, these fields were not being uh, farmed. There were streams of, of refugees all through the area, again moving out with the, because the intelligence was, or their rumors were, that the Germans again were coming into the town of Marsh. About 9 o'clock on the morning of the 20th of December, General Bowling, along with a couple of staff officers, an aide and four MPs, went to Verviers, Belgium, where the First Army headquarters was. He asked what the enemy information was, and the only thing they could tell him was that it was fluid. Also, he asked for what the mission of the division would be in the marsh area. He was told that there the division should go into an assembly area. As the front bulged further westward, the principal road centers of La Rouche and saint vie Belgium, fell to the Germans. Bastogne was encircled and its capitulation seemed certain. Unless the town of Marsh, Belgium, remained in Allied hands, it seemed probable that the Germans could take the River Meuse and sweep on to Paris. 
The 84th Division was ordered to withdraw from its positions on the Roar and take up a defensive line along the Marsh-Houghton Road. It was at this time that we got sudden orders to move. We were loaded into the Army trucks and we started moving back. We heard all kinds of rumors. We heard the Germans had broken through. We heard there was a big offensive. Everything was confused, but all we knew, we were on the road and moving again. Of course, it had only been a month before that we'd moved up by truck, so we were kind of used to it. But this was a night move, in the dark, around the back corners, and orders were changed constantly. We never knew from one minute to the next what was going on. On our way back, we ran into trailers bringing up assault boats to cross rivers with. They apparently were for us, but we weren't going to be there to be with them. We finally found that at the end of this truck route, which was very circuitous, we ended up in the town of Marsh in Belgium. And although our orders were a little unclear, we were told to hold the town at all costs. We first had our first snow at this point, and digging foxholes in icy ground was a little difficult. But we kept always on the move. And our company was seen to be ending up as division reserve. So we were sent here and there on little jobs and filling up the gaps and trying to get the situation under control. We spent our first night in Belgium uh, billeted in a huge stone barn with hay and big fat cows and horses chomping around us and uh, we were excited to be where once again there was some life. We went down the road and had a nice chicken dinner with some eggs and milk, uh, food that we hadn't had it seemed like weeks and weeks. And uh, there seemed to be no nervousness about uh, Germans until later on that night when we spotted uh, way across the valley a, a column of, uh, of uh, tanks going up the road and somebody pointed out that those were German tanks and we had been told we were miles and miles behind the front. And that's when we realized that there was a good deal of confusion uh, in the general picture in Belgium. Well, after that, uh, we went by truck to a little town called Wanlan and uh, met a, a very lovely Belgian woman in a uh, French uh, or a Belgian chateau uh, who had two daughters and she was just getting them into the car to drive them to Brussels. She said they had a, an appointment with the oculist and it was only later that we realized she was fleeing as fast as she could and she knew that the situation was very bad and uh, later on that night we had our first encounter with some uh, German tanks which came along and fired at us and we fired back and uh, they went on uh, back the road that they'd come from, but we realized we were uh, in, in what they call a fluid situation with uh, nobody quite certain where the front lines were, uh, least of all us. I'm Major General Bill Sutton and I was a battalion commander in General Bowling's 84th Rail Splitter Division during World War II. I arrived at the rear CP of the 84th Division in Holland on the 20th of December 1944 and moved down with the division to Marsh, Belgium on the 22nd of December. To say that the situation was fluid is putting it lightly. In Marsh, Belgium, uh, every other house was occupied by Germans and there was uh, firing up and down the streets. The 334th Infantry had organized positions along the front edge of the Marsh Houghton Ridge. I can remember that the foxholes were sometimes 150 yards apart. They'd been dug in frozen ground, sometimes with the aid of explosives. The position was uh, considerably overextended, and uh, various pockets of uh, German tanks and infantry uh, existed all up and down the line and uh, during the day the Germans had infiltrated tanks and infantry into a wooded area back of the front lines and in front of the reserve elements and they were discovered 
quite by accident by a small unit going up to reinforce a, uh, an attack, uh, took the wrong road and ran into this pocket of uh, German tanks and infantry. And they backed off and reported this. The 84th Division artillery fired on this pocket, which was pretty well defined, and they knocked out all of these tanks and killed several hundred Germans. When the artillery had finished firing, one battalion, I remember the 326, had only six rounds of ammunition left. We had other ammunition on the way, but no one knew exactly when it would get there, and it was a rather touch-and-go situation. There are many things imprinted on my mind that will make me always remember the kind of stuff our American soldiers were made of. One incident in particular occurred in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge. We were advancing toward Bale, Belgium, and uh, a mortar shell came in and wounded several men right close around me. There was one man that was almost in arm's reach of me, and I could see that he was hit badly with uh, the back of his head uh, practically bone off, and he was in a state of shock. I tried to comfort the man, prop his head up until the medic could reach him, and all this time, and I shall never forget this, this man was trying to apologize for me for being hit and sorry, almost crying, because he would not get to carry on with the battalion and continue the fight. The Marsh Houghton line, situated as it was at the extreme tip of the bulge, received the full weight of the German attack. Chance had placed the fate of this offensive in the hands of an American infantry division. For the men of the 84th, there was no question as to what must be done. See it next on The Big Picture.